Welcome to Windsor and Royal Borough Museum's Out and About podcast series, in which we'll tell you the hidden histories and stories behind the buildings and landscape of the Windsor that we are all so familiar with today. As you stroll along Pescott Street or down Thames Street towards the river, do you ever think about who walked the pavements before you or who lived in the buildings you pass? Well, if the answer is yes, then stick around because this is the podcast for you. And along the way, we'll be sharing some wonderful clips from our oral history collection because who best to tell you about Windsor than Windsorians themselves? In this episode, we'll take you on a tour of the town to discover the former lives of various current high street shops in Windsor. So to begin, where better to start than the shops located directly opposite Windsor Guildhall, home of Windsor and Royal Borough Museum? If you look out from the museum doors, you'll see TK Maxx and Esquire's Coffee. Many locals, however, will tell you that these premises used to be home to the legendary and renowned Cayley's Department Store. John Cayley and his wife, Mary Ann Cayley, set up a shop on the Castle Hill in 1823. It was in one of the buildings against the castle wall, where the benches now are. Cayley's expanded and moved to its location opposite the Guildhall in 1847. It remained a family business for nearly a century, and in that time frequently supplied hats to Queen Victoria. It is thought that if Queen Victoria saw a hat she particularly liked, she would ask for Cayley's to make her an identical one. Like many of the shops in Windsor, Cayley's had a royal warrant, they displayed the crest of the royal household on the front of the building as a mark of excellence and to ensure everyone knew they supplied goods and services to the royal households. The family sold the store to Selfridges in 1919 and then it was sold again to the John Lewis Partnership in the 1940s but throughout continued to retain the Cayley's name. Dorian Crowhurst worked in Cayley's during the 1940s. At 14 I left school. I left school on the end of the Christmas term and started work January the 4th, 1943 it must have been, at Cayley's Fashion Workroom. I remember my mum made me wear a hat to go to work and they all thought that was hilarious, all the girls thought it was really funny. And um, we all sat round a table and the first thing you had to do was pick up the pins off the floor, uh, hang everybody's coat up for them get everybody's work out for them, light the gas for the irons to get hot, thread up the sewing machines, go downstairs and buy the silcos and buttons and everything that was being used for the workshop. Um, And the hours were half past eight till half past five with an hour for lunch. Pamela Marsden worked in Cayley's from the mid-1970s to the mid-1980s. Do you remember... Um, any famous people coming into Cayley's? I've oh, yeah. heard stories. Lots of famous people um, that I met. One in particular, well, she didn't come in the shop, but, um, was Beryl Reed. And she phoned up and I happened to answer the phone and she wanted some fabric with a jungle theme. And I had to get samples of this fabric, a, a whole lot of different samples, and send them to her. And then she phoned up again, asked for me, and she told me which one she wanted. And we sent out somebody to measure the curtains, and we had it made up in this fabric. And there's a television programme called Through the Keyhole, and the man always used to say, who lives in a house like this? And one day I saw this fabric. I thought, I know who lives in this house. This is Beryl Reed. (laughs) The store sadly closed in 2006 after failing sales and increased competition. Many locals were extremely sad to see it go. Helen Grout particularly felt that it marked the end of an era. We had a big store, Cayley's, a big store. I used to buy everything there, wool, cotton, uh, material for my needlework. And uh, lately... Well, some time ago now, uh, Cayley's closed. I went there before it was closed. I was looking around. Somebody, one of the workers said, are you looking for something? No, I said, I can say goodbye to my shop. It broke my heart. That beautiful shop was gone. Pamela Marsden, however, explains how Cayley's legacy lives on. 
Well, I know when Kayleigh's closed, there was a lot of fuss. And one of the things that somebody suggested was that we had the museum in Kayleigh's building, but uh, it was actually sold uh, uh, to a developer, and it's now a, there's a hotel on the first floor. But they have the hotel does have a a bar at the back, a restaurant area. It's called Kayleigh's Bar. A few doors down from TK Maxx, you'll find the Funky Wood Restaurant, distinct for its floor-length windows on the first floor. Indeed, these unique windows offer a clue to its former life. They had a very specific purpose, to let as much light in as possible, because in 1852, Windsor's first photographic studio was opened here. Many Windsorians had their photographs taken here throughout the 19th century, but perhaps the most notorious person was Roderick Maclean. He was marched to the studio on the 6th of March, 1882, by Windsor Borough Police to have his photo taken for police evidence. Only two days earlier, he had attempted to assassinate Queen Victoria at what is now Windsor and Eaton Central Station. So next time you walk by or visit Funky Wood Restaurant, why not pause and say, cheese? <coughs> Moving up High Street, you'll come across HSBC Bank. In the 19th century, this was in fact a renowned draper called Rogers and Denya. This is where the writer H.G. Wells worked as a 13-year-old boy. As a draper's apprentice, he was required to work a 70-hour week in the shop, all for just six pence a week pocket money. The apprentices took all their breaks in a sort of underground vault, so you wouldn't have seen much daylight. Now, if you look across the street from HSBC, you'll see the museum's wonderfully charming neighbour, the Crooked House. This has been many things in its time, including a pub, a bric-a-brac shop, a cafe, and now, of course, Jersey Pearl, the jewellery shop. It was built in 1718 after the council tore down an earlier building on this site, as they wanted to extend the Guild Hall. But the man who had owned the building took them to court, and the council were forced to rebuild it. Unfortunately, the oak wood they used to build it didn't have enough time to dry out, and as it dried, it made the building become crooked. It is said that the Crooked House leans away in disgust at being next to the local council, who had it built in such a hurry. Time to walk down Pescott Street now, and the next stop is M&S. To you, it might be a place to pop and get your lunch, but did you know that from the mid-19th century, the building was a veterinary practice? It opened shortly after the veterinary profession was recognised by Royal Charter in 1844 and by the 1860s was run by local resident George Simpson, who was born in 1812. It was later taken over by George's son, Henry Simpson, who was a well-known local resident. He was a local justice of the peace and a member of the Windsor Town Council. In 1887, he oversaw the organisation of Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee celebrations in Windsor, including the installation of the now iconic statue of Queen Victoria on Castle Hill. Philip Arton Grime, a local vet who researched the Simpson family history, describes what this involved. He went up to the castle on many occasions to discuss the sighting, etc., of this statue with, uh, with the Queen. And um, at the Jubilee, there was a great um, collection of, of um, uh, military, etc., uh, in the home park, which was on parade in front of um, uh, Queen Victoria, who, who went around the parade in her coach, escorted by Henry Simpson on horseback. Um, for his uh, part in the uh, Golden Jubilee, Henry Simpson was knighted shortly afterwards. Two years later, he was president of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons and he also had a brother who was in practice in Maidenhead and his brother was president of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons a few years later. The vets in Pescott Street remained in the Simpson family until 1906 when it was bought by the owners of another local veterinary practice base on Thames Street. Around 1913 the two practices fully combined and moved to a new practice in William Street, which was later called Patterson and Barditch, and became the vets to the royal household. Moving further down Pescott Street, 
you'll come across Metro Bank and the Post Office. I'll let you find out what these used to be from local resident Doreen Crowhurst. There were three cinemas in Windsor. There was the Empire, where now the Windsor Post Office is. There was the Regal, where the old Boots chemist was. And there was the Playhouse on the bridge just by Eton, before you crossed over the road to Eton. To get into the cinema, it was ninepence old money. I would think that was about 3p now. Ninepence or a shilling or one and six, or if you were really rich, two and sixpence. Two and sixpence you paid if you were going with a boyfriend because you could be in the back row and have a little cuddle. I used to go to the cinema at least three times a week. And if it was a Fred Astaire film, I would come home and pretend I was Ginger Rogers and dance all round the bed with a little silk hanky tied to my little finger in my blue pyjamas. I simply adored the cinema and, and I felt everyone in America lived in a lovely big house and everyone went to really lovely high school. And it was just really escapism. I never saw war films. I always wanted to see musicals. With Fred Astaire mostly, Ginger Rogers, and Deanna Durbin, who used to be a lovely singer. But that was a place to go to. And when the war was on and the siren went, it used to come up on the cinema screen. The siren has sounded. You may leave if you wish. Lots of people did, but I used to always stay there. If you did go out and keep your ticket, you could go back the next night. But it was a fine place for people to go courting, especially in the back row. Pescott Street has always been at the centre of Windsor life, and many current and former residents have fond memories attached to it, from everyday chores to life-changing events. Indeed, for some individuals, like Robin Russell, Pescott Street has helped them find someone special. I was walking up the street, Pescott Street, with a, a fellow guardsman, and he met a girl who he knew, and he said, uh, how about coming out with me Friday? And she said, I can't, because I am m meeting my friend. I'm going out with my friend that night. So he said, that's all right. My mate will come with her. And I said, not blasted lightly. Who do you think I am? <laughs> Anyhow, long and short of it, I weakened. And uh, luckily I weakened because the girl weakened as well, and she later became my wife. <laughs> and so she was a blind date. I had one and sixpence in my pocket which is what uh, what we're looking at now, 7.5p. That would just take us to the Empire Pictures. But instead of which, she said, let's go for the walk and you keep the money in your pocket. So we went for a walk. <laughs> and that was the start of 62 years and nine months of marriage. And for all Windsorians, Pescott Street has just always been there, a consistency in their lives. Pesca Street on your hand was, a, was, a, was a, a place where you would go regularly for your daily needs. There were Burton Home and Colonial, David Gregg's, um, McFisheries, Bakers, Butchers, Greengrocers, Wellmans, the, the Ironmongers, and Piles, the um, furniture people. So you could go there, you needed to go there if you get your food for the week. There's nowhere else to go in Windsor. The stores in Pescott Street have been much the same as they have been for years and years, and they were all small stores. On the left-hand side was a big store called Creeks, which was furniture, and I believe clothing as well. And that is right opposite where the entrance to Ward Royal at the present moment. And on the other side of the road, they're, so they're, on the Ward Royal side they had a small shop, on the other side, which was later the, uh, which is the post office at this present moment, was their other store. Now, Creeks owned the pavement, and every Good Friday they used to fence the pavement off to, to stake their rights that it was their property and not the council's. So I can well remember that we used to go down, it was a thing of going down, uh, for hot cross buns in the town because there were several bakers in, in Pescott Street, all manner of tradesmen. And if you wanted, I always remember on an Easter, Easter morning, you'd go down to get hot cross buns because in those days you only got here the hot cross buns, the bakers on the day. You didn't get them from the supermarkets, very few supermarkets. There was a very small Tesco's along there in the days before they became a, a big firm. 
bishops, international, oh, they know all, all man, all manner of things, and all, all small, and it was very much a small community. As you went up Pescott Street, there was this little baker's who were all their own bread called Dexter's, and you'd go in there, and they'd come out with these great big trays of hot donuts, and every morning. On the way to catch the bus, Mum used to buy us a big bag of these donuts, and because uh, she didn't have time for breakfast, so we used to have these donuts, which was really a treat. Next door to that was a cinema called the Regal. There was a cinema in Pescud Street. It was called the Regal. It was quite a nice cinema, really. On the opposite side of the road, where the post office is now, used to be another cinema that was called the Empire, and we used to call that the Flea Pit. It was uh, more closed in, and if it was full, you used to, um, they'd let you in, and you all had to stand down the side of the cinema and wait until you could get a seat. And uh, I know if it was what they called an A film, I've gone right off the subject of other things now, but I know if it, it was an A film and your children weren't allowed in, you'd stand outside and somebody going in, you'd see an adult going in, You'd say to them, would you take us in, please? We've got our money. So we'd give them our money, and they'd get your tickets at the door and so you could get in and see the film. Otherwise, you couldn't get in because it was what you call an A film. So you weren't allowed in, and that used to happen more often than not. We'd go into Pescud Street, and one of the shops was Ginger's. Now, that was the kind of upmarket place. Very, very nice. Delicatessen, we'd call it now, but Ginger's had some nice stuff. Really was fresh. Meat cut off the bone, and it was nice. Um, cost a little bit more, of course, but um, that's all right for some. And the other place was Dexter's, which was an old-fashioned, what do we call it today? Greg's, the bakers. Um, they did, and I can still taste it, they did some wonderful pasties. Didn't charge a lot. I should think there was very little meat in them, but they were piping hot. And then the real... Pisto Resistance, Wimpy's opened a place in Pescud Street. That was the place to go. Go to Wimpy's. Okay, I, I'd never had burgers before. You didn't. It was something unknown. Um, but you could have a burger and a coffee. Uh, not an expensive price. It saw off a lot of the coffee, uh, the cafes that were basically going. But the Wimpy, to have a Wimpy, that was a real move forward. Um, somewhere to go. And of course, we can't forget Thames Street, which has hosted its fair share of important shops, including Dyson's, which was a tobacconist, jeweller and piano repair shop. When you're next going for a stroll down the street, look out for the clock in the pavement, which marks where the shop used to be located, about where W.H. Smith is now. Also, along Thames Street, was Messenger's Toy Shop, which was the first toy shop in Windsor and was very popular with the children, as local resident Len Nash recalls. When I was a lad, there was Messenger's wonderful toy shop, old-fashioned toy shop that sold Meccano and Dinky toys and fireworks on November the 5th. Tony Messenger's father owned the shop and he recalls what it was like to live above the shop as a child. Now this toy shop, uh, I've talked to a lot of people who have a great deal of memories about this shop. Down in Thames Street, wasn't it? A, a proper toy shop as they described it. It was as good as Hamlet's. It was super. And it was a heaven to live in. <laughs> yeah, I bet from your point of view, yes. <laughs> but I didn't get anything free. I could borrow things. And if, as long as that, the box wasn't hurt and they went back in the box, that was all right. If the box was hurt, I had to pay for them. Right. So this was the age of what, Meccano and Dinkies and all Meccano, that? Meccano, Dinky Toys, Clockwork Railways, and early Electric Railways. Now, before we wrap things up, we have some fun facts for you. Did you know Pescott Street literally means Peapod Street and takes its name from the pea fields that were in the area in the medieval times? It is thought the favourite medieval snack of buttered pea pods was probably sold on the street from the 12th century. Jumping a little through the centuries now, 
By 1900, there were about 150 small shops on Pesca Street, including nine butchers and five fishmongers. And some of the shoppers in town were royal, perhaps more than you might think. Royalty have often been spotted shopping in town. George III apparently used to visit Charles Knight's bookshop on Castle Hill. Charles Knight, with his son, would later start up the local paper, the Windsor and Eastern Express, in 1812. Queen Charlotte would also shop in the town, including at Mrs Cayley's store. Waitrose first shop in Windsor opened on Castle Hill in 1918 and held the first royal warrant to Queen Mary. She would sometimes call in herself, especially for a particular brand of honey soap which she favoured. On one such occasion, the regular manager was on holiday, and the relief manager was so overcome when the Queen walked in that he fainted behind the counter. Well, apparently, anyhow. And finally, maybe you've got to this point in the podcast and are wondering why we have not yet mentioned Darvilles of Windsor. Well, here we go. Darvilles are a local family business that have specialised in the grocery trade and tea blending since 1860. At their peak, they had 21 grocery shops across the Windsor, Maidenhead, Slough and Staines area, with their largest shop being in Pescott Street from 1860 to 1978. They are the oldest company still in Windsor to hold a royal warrant and have done since 1946. That's impressive. Finally, we'll leave you with some reflections by local residents on how shopping in Windsor has changed over the years. We would love to hear your memories of Windsor shops, so please get in touch with any interesting facts. I mean, Windsor is a, a town of, is a retail town. There's very little light industry. But, yeah, a lot of businesses that are sadly no longer here that were, you know, were very um, significant and served Windsor incredibly well. And in Thames Street in particular, I mean, I mean, there were t- companies like Tulls, which were sort of icon shops, Dyson's, which were um, the jeweler shops, you know, the Token House. You know, uh, there were a lot of significant, which made Windsor special and different. Windsor as a town, small town, 30-odd thousand people, would not, under normal circumstances, demand... A command a Marks and Spencer store, for instance, but Windsor has got one. Now, on commercial re- grounds, I doubt whether it would, they wouldn't open a Marks and Spencer's where there are 30,000 people. So, um, because of the historical the history of Windsor, you know, those shops, stores were, were in Windsor. And there were some very big creeks. There was a big sort of mini department store in Pescott Street. But if you look at the Kelly directory, you'll see a lot of names that are now no longer here. Boots had a big branch in Thames Street. And there were, you know, shops down there. But that now is all really restaurants. The town has shifted. There are very few retail shops in the High Street and Thames Street. Those shops are now in Pescott Street and King Edward Court and the Royal Station. And St. Leonard's Road is thriving because it still supports small businesses. If you try and ignore the the signage and just look at the buildings, they're still very much the same as they were when I were a lad. And they've done things like they put the Dyson clock back in the uh, back in the footpath, which was always there when I was when I was growing up. Going back to the arches, now they are all. Um, nightclubs and uh, shops and hairdressers and boutiques. But in them days, they were all belonged to working people, like boat builders, mechanics, and there were not many mechanics because there wasn't many cars about. But eventually there was. Not so very different, you know, I mean, it's all... When the shops are different, the names are different, personalities in the town are different, but, I mean, it's, it's all still... It's all part of life in Windsor, isn't it? Thank you for listening. Look out for the next instalment in our series when we will again be going about town in search of hidden histories. <laughs>